Thank you for joining us for our webinar series, Unlocking Hormonal Health, Proven Strategies for Practitioners. The presentation will begin in a moment. Presentation will begin in a moment. I'm Dr. Christopher Mote. Uh, I want to thank you for joining me. Um, I've been in clinical practice for over 24 years, the first five as a chiropractor, and the remainder as a doctor of osteopathy, all of that in functional medicine. And what I'd most like to talk to you about today is the, the need for clinical understanding of the neuroendocrine system. Um, because nearly every chronic health problem is caused by or exacerbated by stress, it becomes imperative to have a clinical understanding of the neuroendocrine system to provide for better outcomes for our patients. Any discussion of human physiology is complex. Case in point, the metabolic pathways of the human cell, we've all seen this, but it is certainly a good illustration of just how incredibly complex one cell can be. And when you extrapolate, extrapolate that then to systems, um, and the control mechanisms that go on, this conversation can get very deep very quickly. For example, we know on the hormone production side, you have limbic activation. That's the nervous system of the HPA axis stimulating the hormonal response. You have negative feedback loops that will control production. And then you have uh, inflammatory influences, uh, cytokines and their influences on hormone production. And there's others. Then there's the downstream effects, and in those, um, there's great complexity, uh, whether it's the downstream effects themselves or the metabolism of these hormones. Uh, we're looking to understand the genomic expression, the cellular detoxification, gut function, kidney function. The point is, uh, though we will not do a deep dive on these mechanisms today, the point is that this is an incredibly complex physiology. So how do we approach hormone-related conditions, sleep problems, and, and stress-related conditions in some effective manner, something beyond just checking some biomarkers and throwing in some herbal supplements or a prescription hormone and hope that that actually provides good health? If we don't take the time to do this, we're really shortchanging our patients. It is, it is easy to go ahead and check biomarkers uh, and to replace missing hormones, so to speak. But rarely is it as, as simple as measuring the output of an end organ like the ovaries or the adrenals or the thyroid and then just dumping in what's missing and getting a good result. It, it's, it's a happy day when it happens, but it's unfortunately far too common that it's not a good combination. So where do we start? Well, in my opinion, the starting point is at the top, not at the end. Um, for example, measuring salivary cortisol is the end product of a stress response that started in the brain. So I think it would behoove ourselves to start with the nervous system, the neuroendocrine system. And so I'd like to give you just a brief review of how I got to that point and why I think it's so powerful to start there. <clears throat> Excuse me. I ran my first free fraction salivary hormone test back in 2000, 2001, and I ran it on myself and two patients. And I did it because it was my understanding from my mentor at the time that I was going to be measuring bioavailable hormone, the free fraction portion of the hormone that was doing the heavy lifting and the cellular receptors, and that's a better way to do it. And I completely agree with that to this day. 
At the time, we thought that measuring cortisol and seeing imbalances between cortisol and very low DHEA was evidence of something called pregnenolone steel. This was popularized in the book by James Wilson, Adrenal Fatigue in the 21st Century Disease. And, and listen, I, I bought into that. So did my, um, my think tank, the group I was working with. And, um, and it's still a very popular notion today. It was, it was devastating to me because um, in 2009 and 10, when this was disproved, because I was paid by uh, laboratories and supplement companies in that decade to actually propagate and educate uh, physicians on how to interpret salivary hormone testing, how to recognize uh, adrenal dysfunction, and how to support those patients with it. But it was really clear in 2009, 2010, numerous studies came out showing that the adrenal glands don't get tired. In fact, um, when you have symptoms as a result of pervasive stress, it was very clear from these studies it was a depletion of neurotransmitters in the brain. Maybe we should call it burned out brain, but it is not adrenal fatigue. And um, there's there's a lot more on this subject. Um, the the person who really broke this open, who did uh, the meta analysis, who formulated um, the paradigm for diagnosis and treatment, the understanding of the laboratory testing that we were doing, thinking we were measuring adrenal function when really it was the end product of a stress hormone. A uh, stress hormone was an end product of a response that started in the brain. All of that is laid out for you in a fantastic guide called The Role of Stress in the HPA Axis in Chronic Disease Management. This is Dr. Tom Williams' work. Now, while he didn't do any of the original research, he's done a fabulous job of putting it together in very understandable ways for the clinician. And so I strongly recommend that you get this. His um, institute is called the Point Institute. And this is... Uh, worth every every penny all right so this is what really got me moving forward realizing that okay so maybe it's not adrenal fatigue but a better understanding would actually make me a better clinician so here's what i came to know about the stress response it's driven by four major stresses uh limbic activation that's our reptilian brain uh it's their feeling and reacting center um and that will stimulate the HPA axis. In fact, the hypothalamus is part of the limbic system. And then you have inflammation that can hypersensitize this limbic response and drive further HPA axis um, activation. Uh, sleep deficits will actually amplify, um, like turning up the gain on, on um a sound system, uh, you will amplify the stress response. And then both hyper and hypoglycemic episodes are powerful stimulators of the HPA axis. So this is the starting point. Let's jump in. Let's take first a look at the limbic system. Traditionally, I've talked in terms of mental and emotional stress. When we say stress, most patients think of their jobs, their relationships, their finances. Totally get that. But you as a clinician understand that the brain has multiple functions. And if we just kept it simple, we'd be talking about the executive function and the limbic function. So uh, consider that if this is the brain and this is the brain stem, your limbic system made up of the thalamus, the cingulate gyrus, amygdala, hypothalamus, and the hippocampus is tucked in here in the midbrain. And then overlying that is the prefrontal cortex. This is your executive function, and this is your feeling and reacting center. So when we're crawling around and uh, we have no executive function and we don't have words, we're not walking yet, the limbic system is absolutely essential to tell us when we're safe and not safe. It's what picks up on voice tones and cues, um, facial expressions, body language, and it relates to our internal nervous system that we are safe or we are not safe. And that's where that first initial stress response comes from, the limbic system. As we get older, this can become problematic. Um, excuse me. Um, so the end product of the stress response then is limbic activation, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenals, thus the cortisol. And in the medulla, we have the adrenaline and the norepinephrine. We also get a DHEA and aldosterone. We're not going to be spending a lot of time talking about those today. You can measure this 
with something called the cortisol awakening response. And secretory immune functions are closely related, if not an extension. You could almost call it the neuroendocrine immune function. I think some do. So you can measure the cortisol awakening response and see an overactive limbic activation. And if you have that, you'll also find um, persistently low secretory IgA in the mucosal tissues, whether you're collecting fecal uh, SIGA or salivary SIGA. And if you've got the whoop strap or aura ring, Apple Watch, Garmin, I'm not a fan of the Fitbit, not currently. Um, but you can measure heart rate variability as a direct measure of the sympathetic nervous system. And so there's lots of ways now to see if the limbic activation is what's driving your patient's HPA axis and their symptoms that you see here most commonly, uh, anxiety or irritability, poor concentration, um, worsening pain, poor sleep. And this is the patient who shows up in your office with white coat syndrome. And, and at home, they can check their blood pressure. It's fine. But as soon as they show up, they're already thinking how they're going to get chastised for having high blood pressure, and it goes straight up. So their limbic system is kicking in when they come to the office. Okay, here's how you recognize it. I've put on the screen three examples of the cortisol awakening response I pulled from the um, Endo Plus and the one-day hormone check that we run in, in our office. And the first one on the left is recognized um, by the first cortisol, Uh, the first cortisol is collected within five minutes of awakening. So in that saliva sample, we measure cortisol, and it's reflective of the cortisol that was happening in a patient's sleep. 30 minutes after that, we collect again, and it should rise. Now, I, I generally use the guide of at least 50% to as much as 150%. I think the studies actually showed between 30 and 130% was a better reference range. But the point is, if you're in the 30 to 50%, then you're getting good uh, cortisol rise. And that happens when we just wake up. Our, our limbic system takes uh, stock of our surroundings. And even if we're safe in our bedroom, we still have thoughts about uh, the problems from the day before, the obligations that lay out ahead of us, um, the persistency of some of our uh, psychological stresses, and bang, a normal functioning um, stress response from the HPA axis would include a rise of cortisol between 50 and 150%. When you see something dramatically higher in that first 30 minutes, now you know you're looking at an overactive stress response. Our term for it is a chronic threat response because it, it is a pattern in the brain of waking in the morning and having a uh, an above normal, uh, an exaggerated, a uh, hypervigilant, any of the terms you want to use, um, a neurologic response. And some people feel it. I had a patient describe, describe it to me like this. He said, I wake up in the morning and my brain says, <clears throat> and I feel it. He says, I can't concentrate. I'm foggy and I feel anxious. And so those are really typical when you have an over-exaggerated or a chronic threat response. If this persists, you will deplete the brain chemistry. This was what was seen in all these wonderful studies. They, uh, they did brain biopsies on mice to see that they had a, a deficit in this flat cortisol awakening response. This is when your second cortisol sample actually goes flat, rises by less than 30%, or even drops. So in these mice, they saw a depletion of dopamine and serotonin and GABA and glutamate and these neurotransmitters had been used up faster than they could be replaced. So this is the final stage. Here's a normal response to stress, irrespective of how much stress the patient is dealing with. This first example represents stress resilience. The second one is a chronic threat response, and it, it represents an exaggerated neurologic response, and an unreliable limbic system that thinks everything is a stress. Stre uh, Everything <laughs> is a threat. That means this is the person who walks through the mall and gets a headache, a migraine, before they get out from all the smells. You give them a supplement that's of high quality, and yet they react to it. Um, they have a change to the routine, and they develop symptoms. So everything in their environment becomes a threat. 
when you have an overactive stress response. And if this persists, then you will deplete the brain chemistry and you're dealing with flat cortisol awakening response. And these patients tend to have more fatigue, more chronic pain, more insomnia, and more depression. So this is the, the progression, and you'll find that if you're measuring these, you can start working on a patient to support their stress response and check it four months later, and they'll actually be back over here. Many times, if not most times, uh, the progression towards health, a healthy brain and a healthy stress response, goes from flat back to the chronic threat response, and then it becomes very apparent, if it wasn't initially, that the patient needs to work on their limbic system. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So limbic activation, what causes this? So um, uh, Annie Hopper's work uh, talks about limbic impairment. And she cites three reasons for this. One is a physical or emotional injury that hasn't healed. So again, the big T traumas that can come with some emotional injury or physical injury is number one on the list. Number two would be some type of chronic infection, chronic toxin. Um, in our practice, most commonly, we find biotoxins from H. pylori or uh, mold and mycotoxins or intestinal parasites or bacteria and fungal elements in the nasal passages, maybe a root canal that's gotten infected. Any and all of those in combination can represent a chronic toxin or infection that can hyperstimulate the nervous system. And the last one is just pervasive psychological stress. Um, if you're somebody who has been in a, an abusive relationship or you take care of um, a demented parent in your home or you've raised an autistic child, there's just some psychological stresses that go on for, for years. And that would be an, a third type. You could throw in their head injuries as a type of physical uh, injury that we see from time to time. But this is what it would look like. You would have somebody who's, um, I'll go backwards. Um, you would have somebody whose uh, cortisol awakening response goes shooting up more than 150%. But there's another type that you'll present with, as you'll see as well. And that's somebody whose percentage rise may be within normal parameters. But both of these first two are well above established, established norms. So if both of them are elevated, don't be fooled by the statistical calculation. Either you've got a patient who has significant rise in that second collection, or uh, they both of them are elevated. Both of those would be limbic activation. So what do we do? All right. So this is one of the first things we deal with in our practice because it is so prevalent. We can't get them sleeping. We can't get their mood right. We can't get them even sometimes to take the supplements that we're providing because they're so reactionary. So we use a couple of different programs. We will use limbic retraining programs by uh, Annie Hopper. It's called Dynamic Neural Retraining System. You can Google retraining the brain. I'm sorry, that's her website, or just Google DNRS. And then there's Ashok Gupta's program. It's also excellent. It's a, it was actually out first. They've both been on the market for 15 and 20 years, and they've helped a lot of patients to retrain the brain using principles of neuroplasticity. So we'll do that right up front with patients where it's obvious. Sometimes we'll get deeper into the process. I haven't been able to convince them, and then they become believers when we start to show them their cortisol awakening response. Um, and then there is the stellate ganglion block. And we work closely with the Stella Center out of Oak Brook, um, Oak Brook Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Um, Dr. Lipoff and his team there have been pioneering the stellate ganglion block to reset the sympathetic nervous system. So when you have somebody who's locked in chronic fight, flight, or freeze response, and they can't get the functions of the parasympathetic to really work properly, uh, digestion, procreation, uh, sleep. So when that happens, you can also get a um, nerve block on the cervical sympathetic ganglion uh, done by a trained specialist, in this case, by the Stella Center. And patients can get a, a reset. Uh, it's kind of like a frozen, a computer that's been frozen. You unplug it, plug it back in, and you reset the hardware. 
in this case, uh, you can get a reset of the sympathetic nervous system. And this can last anywhere from six months to six years, depending on whether the patient is still going through heavy trauma. Other things we've seen effective in the short term, that while we use these two long term, um, in the short term, we've used uh, propranolol and nat natalol. Uh, both, both have been used for headaches. And especially if we think the headaches or migraines are caused by the limbic system, this is a very effective short-term strategy. We use very low doses of these beta blockers one, two, and three times a day to get some relief of symptoms. You can also uh, work with GABA, though I don't find it works very well if you have low progesterone. We use L-theanine, Hooperzine, uh, which protects the limbic, uh, excuse me, the hippocampus from damage uh, from high cortisol and 5-HTP to raise serotonin levels and offset um, dopamine and some of the other excitatory neurotransmitters. Uh, there's vagal nerve stimulation, there's medication, uh, excuse me, meditation, and then there's any number of breathing and other stress techniques, all of which are helpful, all of which are necessary, but they don't provide long-term relief, whereas limbic retraining can actually involve rewiring of the brain. It involved neuroplasticity, and we've seen, um, we've seen long-lasting relief with those. Okay, now let's jump into inflammation, another one that's ubiquitous. Um, so many patients are dealing with inflammation. Uh, the biggest categories that we see are those from foods uh, and those from infections. So when you have a, an elevated stress response, you actually are going to see cortisol high and secretory IgA low. For, for many years in, early in my career, we would actually measure salivary uh, cortisol and salivary uh, IgA in the same specimen. And when we saw a normal cortisol, we would frequently see a normal secretory IgA. And then when we'd see an elevated cortisol four hours later, we'd see a depressed secretory IgA at the same sample. Four hours later, we could see a normal cortisol secretory IgA is right back. So the point I'm making is that this mucosal barrier, largely protected by mechanical barriers and mucus, but also by these immune globulins, these microscopic Y-shaped proteins are scattered throughout the mucosal tissues, every mucosal tissue, which represents the interface between our external world and our internal world. The only way to get food, water, oxygen, and toxins and infections into the body is through a break in the skin or a mucosal membrane. So the secretory IgA becomes one of the most critical um, functions that we have to pay attention to, and it's directly, directly influenced by the limbic system and the HPA axis. So if you have increased cortisol and HPA axis activation, you will have an increased uh, permeability of your mucosal barrier, your leaky gut function, and then that allows any manner of infections to get into the mucosal tissues and stick around, uh, whether it's something growing in the nasal passages or H. pylori in the stomach. And then you'll have an increased penetration of all antigens, including food and food toxins. And so there's your food allergens and the internal antibody response, the delayed food allergies we see in patients. Did you know that overtraining, that is raising your heart rate and keeping it there for over an hour, this is the, your, your endurance athletes and people that frequently are seen as very healthy and fit, they actually have um, a phenomenon in endurance athletes most of them could tell you about it, where they have a tremendous number of digestive issues. They get out and run and they'll have diarrhea or they have stomach problems and they have food issues. And it's because when you, when you go at a heart rate elevation for a long enough period of time, you will stimulate cortisol and you'll actually start to cause a thinning of the mucus lining and a pulling apart of the tight junctions and you create increased antigen penetration. And you'll see increased... Uh, cytokines, tumor necrosis factor alpha and IL-1 beta when you have that. You also have uh, other cytokine activation from toxins like urease, which is one of four inflammatory produ toxins produced by the uh, H. pylori. Uh, aflatoxins, which is a mycotoxin from mold. Ochratoxin, the same thing. And then these parasites, which we find on our GI effects testing all the time, actually do stimulate their own cytokines. Inflammatory responses whip 
the limbic response into a frenzy and further hypersensitize the stress response. They make problems worse. And so we want to address any inflammation. We start by cleaning up the diet. We ask all our patients to get away from gluten, but also gliadin, which is found in oats and millet. And I have patients that love their oats and they love their sourdough made with millet. And I say, I'm sorry, because you are sensitive to gluten. You're also sensitive to gliadin. And those two foods don't have gluten, but they have gliadin. So millet and oats are out as well. Glyphosate, which is in every grain sprayed in the United States that's not labeled organic. And even some of those have some because you get runoff from adjacent fields where it was sprayed. But that herbicide Roundup is is uh, got an active ingredient called glyphosate. Most of you've heard of it. And it doesn't wash out in the food. So you're ingesting that, which also causes transient leaky gut. It also pulls apart the, you know, the tight junctions. And so you'll get increased antigen penetration. And there's no place in that if you're trying to take inflammation out of your gut. And many people don't realize that soy proteins have molecular similarity to gliadin. And so they can also stimulate inflammation. Um, that's not soybean oil found in salad dressings. That's not soy lecithin found in chocolate, but it is the soy proteins, tofu, edamame, even if it's uh, non-GMO, it has molecular similarity. So if you're going to go to the trouble of avoiding gluten gliadin, I would not um, eat soy proteins either. And then you have the infections. And one out of three people walking statistically has H. pylori, a bacterial infection, and we see it creating um, dramatically better health when we find it and get rid of it in all of our patients. It seems to be related to almost every autoimmune patient I've ever seen. Uh, we find it, and it's one of the keys to reducing their um, autoimmune state. And then I deal with more mold in our practice than I care to. And those, of course, make mycotoxins, some of the most poisonous substance known to our immune system. They will sabotage multiple uh, functions of our immune system, the cytokines that raise your inflammation. They'll take down natural killer cell activity, and they absolutely will sabotage T cell function and make you more uh, likely to um, have an autoimmune condition. And then if a patient's got a, a root canal that's more than five years old, we're suspicious that the dental x-ray didn't find um, apical uh, periodontitis, which is an infection at the root. And so we'd send them for a cone beam CT. And then we look in almost everybody's nasal passages with a nasal swab for a culture, both a bacterial culture and a, uh, a fungal culture can be done uh, so you can see what you're dealing with and how you're going to treat that. But those are our attempts. So again, we'll take uh, gluten out of the diet, gliadin along with it. We do PCR stool testing for H. pylori. Um, that will usually find it, but sometimes the H. pylori infection is so deep in the um, uh, gastric pits where the parietal cells are pumping out um, high levels of stomach acid that even food and stool passing over them is not going to carry any organisms out into your stool sample. So when we suspect it and we don't find it, we'll even put patients on N-acetylcysteine to break up any biofilms and release some organisms. And we'll do that for uh, 30 days and then we'll recheck the stool again. We, we take at least two stool tests for PCR for H. pylori before we say, maybe, that, maybe we missed it. It's not there. Uh, you can also get both O and P and PCR um, in stool for parasites on your GI effects. Uh, we do both the bacterial culture and the yeast culture on our GI effects. And then um, we send an, a nasal culture to Microbiology DX, and they're going to do both a, a bacterial culture and a fungal culture. And if you have Marcons, which is uh, a staphylococcal organism associated with mold, and water damaged buildings, they'll do a biofilm analysis. And that allows you to uh, create a strategy of nasal sprays to get rid of both bacterial and fungal elements and the inflammation that they're, they're uh, creating. A cone beam CT, typically done by endodontists, is the, the gold standard for finding uh, root canals that are infected because dental x-rays are thought to miss as many as half of those teeth that are actually harboring infection, and that will certainly create inflammation in your patient's body. 
Okay, let's talk sleep. So it goes both ways when it comes to sleep. Your HPA axis can completely sabotage your sleep and your sleep will, will activate your HPA axis. So it's, it's circular and you have to figure out where we're going to intervene. And this is again where salivary hormone testing comes to the rescue because you get to see the changes um, as you move through this. Now, we run uh, the Endo Plus and the One Day Hormone Check because we like to also see melatonin. And you can get three bio, uh, three samples of melatonin, uh, one upon awakening, one in the afternoon when people complain of being low uh, energy, and then at three in the morning. And so we get to see melatonin deficits, which I don't think honestly are that common. But when you get all three melatonins and you start to see elevations in the morning and at noon, you know you've got circadian rhythm disruption. So we like that test. And then when you pair that with a diurnal cortisol, the four-point cortisol everybody's familiar with, um, the bedtime cortisol is frequently elevated. I'd say half to three-quarters of our patients have an elevation in their bedtime cortisol. That's further evidence of circadian rhythm disruption. Normal cortisol is supposed to be highest when we wake up come down through the day and at your lowest point right before bed. If it's not, having a cortisol that's above range, excuse me, will block the release of growth hormone. Growth hormone is what's going to stimulate the deep and slow wave sleep where you get tissue repair, inflammation control, natural killer cell activation, and T cell discrimination. The magic happens in deep sleep. And we actually have our patients wear the whoop strap. It's the least um, expensive for the best data. And we can see uh, patients deep in REM sleep improve when we give phosphatidylserine four hours before bed to lower this cortisol. Again, phosphatidylserine four hours before bed to lower the cortisol. The other thing that can happen in, in rare instances is you'll have patients who come home and their home life is more chaotic than at work. And so that can also drive your cortisol up at bedtime. But when it comes to circadian rhythms that are causing this pattern, I'm convinced the most common cause for this elevated cortisol at bedtime is the very screens you and I are looking at right now. TV screens, computer screens, phones, even the overhead fluorescent and incandescent lights. It doesn't take intense light, but the blue spectrum, blue, indigo, and violet, has a wavelength that stimulates the back of the eye and a hormone called melanopsin. Think opposite of melatonin. If you want to read more about that, you can read it in, the, in a book. I think it was put out in 2017 called The Circadian Code um, by Sachin Panda, and uh, it's a fantastic book on circadian rhythms in general. But this is evidence, especially when you pair it with a low cortisol in the morning, you will usually, if you put this with melatonin from the same patient and overlaying it, you'll start to see the circadian uh, rhythm disruption uh, right away. Now, the way we help patients to regain that circadian rhythm, many of which who lost it during COVID when they spent all their day indoors and spent too much time looking at TV and, and screens at night. What happens is if you don't get at least 10,000 lux, of intensity from your light. And you can't get that indoors unless you've got a happy lamp or some town thousand lux lamp sitting next to you. You have to go outdoors. In Colorado, where we live, on a cloudy day, it can be 18,000 lux uh, just on a cloudy day or sitting in the shade. So you, if you go outdoors 20 or 30 minutes, Take off your sunglasses because you'll block 90% of the intensity and 20,000, 30,000 lux day becomes two or 3,000. Not good enough. Remember, you need 10,000 lux for 20 or 30 minutes, six days a week, preferably in the morning, so that your brain fully sees daylight. If you look outside and, and, it's, and it's light outside, that's great. Cognitively, you know it's daytime, but our brains don't work that way. They actually need the intensity of the sun to hit the back of the eye. We're not looking at the sun. We are still protecting our eyes with a visor or a shade tree or a porch. But the point is, you got to be outdoors. You got to take off the sunglasses. You have to protect your eyes. It's 20 minutes, six days a week, 
And you pair that with 90 minutes of blue blocking with those orange glasses. The clear ones don't have enough protection. They only block 50%. That's good for eye strain and headaches when you're looking at the computer by day. But the last 90 minutes of the day, our patients put on these fully orange or amber or yellow blue blocking glasses so that you block out the blue spectrum. And when you do that six nights a week, pairing it with the outdoor light, you can take somebody who's bent is to say, oh, I've always been a night owl. I go to bed at two in the morning and I sleep till 10 in the morning. No, we want to move that back because all eight hours are not the same. And if we can get people sleeping between 10 and midnight and get eight hours of quality sleep and their tracker says they're picking up seven and a half hours of total sleep, they're probably getting their five to six cycles of sleep. And then in that same seven and a half hours of total sleep, we want to see three and a half hours of REM plus deep. We add them together because I've worn multiple trackers simultaneously. They disagree on how much REM and how much deep, but when you add them together, they all seem to agree, everybody except the Fitbit. So um, we use phosphatidylserine to to, um, pull this down and get better deep sleep, but then we use circadian rhythm retraining to make sure that uh, that we can change this pattern altogether. Now, we also use um, uh, progesterone, but we're going to come back to that later. That happens when you have low progesterone. It opens the GABA receptors in your nervous system and allows for GABA to work. If you've ever given GABA to patients and it didn't seem to do anything, it's probably because they had low progesterone. Giving some oral micronized bioidentical progesterone right before bed can open up those GABA channels and shut off a racing mind and get better sleep. Then poor sleep can also jack with the HPA axis. And here's the perfect example. So if somebody has sleep apnea, undiagnosed, untreated, or maybe it's diagnosed and they just go, I don't want to wear that CPAP. Well, this is what's going to happen. Um, They'll actually have a stress response in their sleep with every waking episode. And they can wake up with dramatically higher levels of cortisol than you would expect would be in somebody's sleep. This is frequently somebody with sleep apnea. So, again, stressful sleep can hyperactivate your limbic uh, system and your HPA axis response. Well, I mentioned some of these interventions earlier. We use 1 to 300 milligrams of phosphatidylserine four hours before we want to drop the cortisol, and we frequently have them do it again just before they get into bed to keep the cortisol down. And we've seen on our trackers that we're affecting deep sleep, which is Fantastic. Melatonin, while we don't use a lot of it, is best when we get one to five milligrams. And that seems to help the REM sleep. Again, I can't tell you which is which on every tracker, but it seems to help. The uh, progesterone that we mentioned earlier is oral micronized, bioidentical. Uh, It's taken right before bed to open up those GABA receptors and quiet the mind. I've really started to like magnesium threonate lately. I guess with the threonate, it gives better um, absorption into the brain from the blood-brain barrier, which is great. I can tell you that when we use 150 milligrams of elemental magnesium, and usually you have to get about 1,000 milligrams of, of mag threonate to get 150 milligrams of elemental, but that can really help um, with deep sleep. We like L-theanine because it increases alpha wave activity with just one or 200 milligrams before bed. And you can start using some of these together as you see these unfold on your uh, salivary hormone testing. We also know uh, about blue blocking. We talked about that. Uh, Heat, sauna, hot tub, depending on how long you're in there, can really help to calm the nervous system. Uh, If you get in there too hot for too long and your limbic system is already damaged, you can actually make for a stress response before bed. And these are people that really shouldn't be doing a lot of heat before they go to bed. And then if a patient is sedentary and not active and not active at all, then just getting up and walking 30 minutes a day can really help with sleep. And if they are somewhat active, uh, getting them uh, with greater intensity three times a week either some hit or preferably some resistance training, you can also deepen sleep. So these are our strategies for sleep. And then finally, um, low and high blood sugars both can trigger the HPA axis resulting in higher cortisol, epinephrine, and and glucagon. Um, So we want to work together um, to balance 
our patients um, high and low blood sugar episodes. We have them start by eating approximately half their body weight in protein grams. So I weigh 220. My goal is uh, each day to have 100 or more grams of protein. That has been studied uh, over 25 years ago. Some great studies. They were initially discounted because they were paid for by the um, egg board and the dairy board and the um, other people who have an influence. But since when have studies <laughs> been tossed out just because of the person that paid for them? Um, I got to say that when we get our patients eating dramatically more protein than most of them are used to, they will immediately feel better energy. They sleep better. And that's obviously if their digestive system can handle it. Um, you'll read in that book, Circadian Code, that if you eat your first meal at least six days a week at the same time, within 15 or 20 minutes, the same time, six days a week, you'll start to put your body on a rhythm of eating that would raise uh, stomach acid levels in anticipation of the meal and digestive enzyme release and motility, absorption, even cellular uh, receptivity to glucagon or to uh, glu glucose is raised when we eat at the same time. We don't like the idea that uh, intermittent fasting would start at noon. We think everybody's in a catabolic state when they get up, and we'd like to break that catabolic state if you're trying to improve your health, grow lean muscle mass. If you're interested in longevity, we think you should be breaking your fast within two hours of eating. And then front load about half your protein grams at the first meal. And we have a lot of patients that say, I'm not even hungry in the morning, Dr. Mo. There's no way I'm eating 40 grams of protein for breakfast. I'm like, well, you can, but you have to train your body. It is a petulant child that needs to be trained. Put it on a schedule and it will treat you better. Um, uh, when I hear people say, well, I like to listen to my body and I just eat when I'm hungry. I'm like, well, that's because you've inadvertently trained your body not to eat at certain times. We're also not a big fan of having one meal a day. That may be great for blood sugar. Uh, that might actually reverse some metabolic diseases. But if played out over a long period of time, I don't know how somebody could ever eat enough protein at one sitting to maintain the body's demands for protein. So we would have people eating two and three meals a day within a 10-hour eating window, starting within two hours of getting up if possible, and ending at least two hours before bed so they can maximize their deep sleep. Patients who also have classic symptoms of poor blood sugar control on their, on their um, salivary hormone test, and there is, there is some you can find on there, uh, some patterns that will tip you off. We would have them take um, a morning drink that usually has uh, high fiber like flaxseed flour or gour gum, inulin, which is a, a prebiotic from artichoke extract, uh, glucomannan is an insoluble fiber, lipoic acid, vanadyl sulfate. So drinking that in the morning can really um, level out spikes and even um, rapid absorption of, of carbs throughout the day. So these are our therapies. Uh, for getting people's blood sugar under control. All right, I'm repeating myself. There's intent here. You've got mental and emotional stresses. Think limb limbic activation, hypothalamic stimulation. Um, and then you've got inflammation from inflammatory cytokines. You've got poor sleep and you've got blood sugar swings, high and low. Those are the four drivers. And if we will pay attention to those, everything else gets easier. When I have ignored all of those, maybe more importantly or more accurately, when my patients have ignored these things, despite our best attempt to give it to them, right, uh, the information in group classes and one-on-one and -on -one appointments, um, when these are ignored, supplements and hormones don't work great to ameliorate symptoms or improve health. And then there's downstream effects. So a lot of you know this already, but I think it bears repeating that cortisol is catabolic. It is called the death hormone. Too much cortisol breaks down tissues. Not enough cortisol doesn't facilitate cellular function. But in any case, cortisol causes breakdown of stored resources throughout the body, glycogen from your muscle, and eventually the muscle itself into the releasing amino acids that get repackaged in the liver as glucose for your brain. And then, of course, bone mineral density. So how do we prevent rapid breakdown? Did you hear that? How do we present, 
How do we prevent breakdown from becoming rapid? Well, you would have to slow metabolism. Thyroid is the controller of metabolism. So there is an inbuilt, inbuilt defense mechanism, actually two of them, where when cortisol is released from a stress response, it goes back up into the brain and provides feedback to the hypothalamus. In this case, the hypothalamus and pituitary will actually slow the release of TSH, which would slow the production of thyroid hormone T4, and that would lower your metabolic rate, your metabolic demand. That means your rate of metabolism goes down, so you don't break down as fast. Cortisol also goes into the liver and it blocks conversion of T4 to T3 and encourages reverse T3. Now, if you've seen enough of these uh, thyroid panels where you get T4 and T3, you can recognize this stress response that is slowing the metabolism of the thyroid. You don't have to run a re reverse T3. But if you're running the thyroid uh, panel from Genova, they include this, and it makes it really easy to see these slow thyroid functions, the secondary hypothyroidism um, due to um, a stress response. And that's one where I would be very careful not to upregulate or add thyroid hormone just to make the patient feel better because I've seen some really sad cases of people who within six years of, you know, persistent thyroid hormone um, supplementation in the face of just really low TSH have wound up um, normal bone density and then osteoporosis within six years. So we want to respect the fact that when the body's in a breakdown state, that we don't speed it up and we understand that we're working upstream on the neurologic system to calm down the stress response. All right. And then sex hormones are changed by HPA axis activation as well. When we see increased uh, cortisol and HPA axis activation, we frequently see lower progesterone, lower testosterone, and lower estradiol. And a lot of that is that we're measuring free fraction. You may not always see this in the serum, but we're measuring free fraction that's outside the, the bloodstream and, and not attached to the sex hormone binding globulin, right? So um, the HPA axis activation and excessive cortisol states correspond to increased sex hormone binding globulin. And that's part of why we see lower free hormone. All right. Sex hormones also work on the HPA axis. I think this is a, a minor point. I don't use this in my day-to-day, -day, but I just thought I'd throw this out there to you. That estradiol can increase HPA axis activation because it impairs the negative feedback loops. Again, I'm not dosing estradiol based on how I think it's going to infl influence my HPA axis, but it, there is some. Progesterone can decrease the HPA axis. We think it's because it helps to open those GABA receptors, calming the limbic response. And then progesterone actually provides a substrate for cortisol production. So we don't use high doses of progesterone, especially when we're using them to help people with sleep or uh, anxiety. We don't want to put so much progesterone in that we actually can raise cortisol levels. And then testosterone is suppressed with the production of testosterone is suppressed by HPA axis activation. And low testosterone actually sensitizes the HPA axis. So it goes both ways. Stress can lower your testosterone and low testosterone can ramp up your HPA axis. Okay, we're going to wrap up. I've got some illustrations here with one case. Her name is Melissa. She's 55 years old. And the way this played out was pretty fascinating. Um, I want to make sure I get it right. So I'm going to refer to my notes here. But you're looking at four cortisol awakening responses all on the same patient. The first one in August, and then four months later, we did it again in December, and then eight months later in April, and 10 months later. And in the very first one, what you're looking at in August of 2022 is a flat cortisol awakening response. The second 30-minute 30, 30 sample does not rise by at least 30 to a 50%. And so that's indicative of a depleted brain chemistry and a flat cortisol awakening response. The second one was four months later. Now, she had had a concussion in between, but that second one in December shows a normal cortisol awakening, uh, normal waking cortisol, which is virtually the same as the previous waking cortisol, but now, 30 minutes later, her cortisol spikes almost 200%. Then 
Eight months later, in April, you see the percentage increases at 61%. And so we're actually looking at a more normal cortisol awakening response. Remember what I said, though, her waking sample is now elevated. So this isn't a truly normal cortisol awakening response, um, but you're starting to see an improvement. Now, one of the things that was done between December and April was the stellate ganglion block. And that was the um, bupivacaine injection to numb up the sympathetic ganglion and to help reset it. We saw in this patient dramatically lower startle reflex, and she says her sleep got remarkably better. But what you're seeing then is slight improvement in the cortisol awakening response. But it wasn't until 10 months later that we saw it get fully normal. And this patient did a second stellate ganglion block, also found and treated H. pylori which is a major stimulator of inflammation and can worsen the limbic response. So between the stellate ganglion block and the uh, HPA axis improvement that we saw with the elimination of the inflammatory infection, H. pylori, we're now uh, dealing with a perfectly normal cortisol awakening response. All right, now let's overlay this with the diurnal rhythm. So this same patient had um, a diurnal rhythm in August that had high levels throughout the day, indicating um, a high level of stress on her system. And that corresponded with her psychological stresses. Um, this patient, let's see. Yeah, this patient between August 22nd and, uh, and December 22nd had a concussion. And I mentioned that earlier. So here's her diurnal rhythm post-concussion. And then uh, between December and April, um, things did not go well for this patient either. Uh, she had COVID in January. Uh, her sister died in February and she got shingles in March. And so this was her cortisol, uh, excuse me, this is her diurnal rhythm when we checked it in April. Um, and then uh, you see this is actually fairly normal, except for just a slight increase at bedtime. Um, I can tell you this patient doesn't like wearing her boob blocking glasses. But otherwise, these cortisol samples uh, are the nor most normal she's had uh, yet. And uh, the difference between April and February is that um, she got that second SGB injection and she treated H. pylori. Okay, so now let's put those side by side. So here you can see a flat cortisol awakening response. Now the brain, at this point, we would make the statement that she has low stress resilience. The brain just does not organize a stress response efficiently, and there'll be a lot of symptoms in patients like this. Um, but this is the inability to organize the appropriate stress response, and yet she has some pretty high cortisol levels. If her brain was working properly, she may be way up here in the white spaces. Then this patient had a concussion, and that's when we saw the cortisol awakening response was jarred, and it became an overactive cortisol awakening response, and you can see now the effect on her cortisol diurnal rhythm. Yeah, and you can really see the pronounced uh, uh, bedtime cortisol. The patient then had an SGB to reset the neurologic system, and yet had massive stresses. This was, again, the time frame where they had COVID, her sister died, and um, um, COVID, sister died. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, and then shingles. And so despite the normalization uh, or somewhat normalization of the cortisol awakening response, you can still see very high stress levels. So the brain is responding better to stress, but the amount of stress on the system is still tremendous. Uh, then 10 months later, and after a second round of the SGB injection to reset the sympathetic nervous system, and of course, along the way, all the lifestyle um, and sleep interventions we've been talking about, most of everything that you heard me talk about, we had to do with and for this patient. So it wasn't just an SGB, but that silly ganglion, ganglion block was certainly helpful. And now you see the complete normalization of the HPA axis um, from the cortisol awakening standpoint and some of the most normal actual cortisol levels in our diurnal rhythm. There's one more layer to this. As we go through this, 
We also did in the same test, we were doing the one day hormone check up until February when we started with the endo plus. Um, but on the one day hormone check, we get the cortisol awakening response. We get the diurnal cortisol and we get sex hormones. And you can see this 55 year old patient, 54 at the time, had very low sex hormone levels, which makes sense because she had such a, a flat cortisol awakening response. The brain was just not able to organize all of the responses within the body, not the gonadal response or the thyroid response or the adrenal response. So really low levels of sex hormones. So we started on lowest level progesterone, the 100 milligrams of uh, oral micronized bioidentical progesterone right before bed. And you can see the benefit she got from that. And then we started her on the lowest estradiol patch. I like the patches because they're a uniform dosing. They are bioidentical now. They're available through retail pharmacies. And you can actually start cutting them. We start patients at the 0.25 milligrams um, release. And so that is the lowest dose. And if patients are still having hot flashes, for example, we'd say take a, a second patch, cut it in half and do one and a half patches. And by the time we get 90 days, we should be able to figure out the lowest dose that helps with symptoms. And then we stay there for 90 days and we repeat the test. So uh, when we came back around eight months later and we checked her hormones again, she had, uh, again, excellent levels of estrogen and progesterone. Um, what we had seen is very low testosterone after starting the patch and the progesterone capsule. So we started her on, again, a very low dose, uh, 0.5 milligrams of testosterone daily in a cream. And when we came back around, we saw that those levels had come up pretty nicely eight months later. Um, and then uh, we were able, with better cortisol awakening response, better um, organization of the stress response and these three primary hormone systems, adrenals, thyroid, and gonadal, because now we've got better functioning in the brain, we were able to taper her doses of the patch. Um, and she's taking now testosterone only twice a week instead of every day. And yet we've got some of the best sex hormone levels and the best cortisol awakening that we've had in this whole two-year period. All right, last slide. Here we go. Thank you so much for your attention. You can refer back to this. I think there's a YouTube channel associated with um, Genova, and you can look at this again as needed. But the, the, the summary is this new Endo Plus test that they've come out with is fantastic. I don't spend as much time on the metabolites as other doctors do. So if they want to measure urinary metabolites, they have that option for you but I focus heavily on the cortisol awakening responses you've seen in conjunction with diurnal rhythms. I love the addition of the secretory IgA. If you want to see LH, FSH, um, uh, gosh, what's the other one? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it. But just about any hormone you want to measure can be gotten on this test and you can tailor it not only to your protocols and your paradigm, but even when you want to come back around and just check certain hormones that were out or off or out of range, you can make sure that your therapies have got your patients in a safe range. So I love the Endo Plus that they've introduced. And then we start with limbic activation and glycemic control. These are the two things that patients can and need to work on, their blood sugar and their stress response. You'll see elevated cortisol awakening responses indicative of that hyperlimbic activation. You'll see low secretory IgA, something you can also get in the saliva on the, on the Endo Plus. You'll see an elevated diurnal cortisol. You'll see all of their samples above the, the shaded reference range. And you'll see changes to estradiol, testosterone, and progesterone. Uh, we use sleep trackers to help patients see that their lifestyle is not lined up. They're not spending enough time in bed or they've got too many lights on before bed. They're looking at screens too late so that they can actually see when they're getting the requisite three and a half hours of deep plus REM. And then we love the, the melatonin that we can get in the saliva samples as well, because it helps us to see circadian rhythm disturbances. And that's where you're going to really maximize your deep and REM sleep when you retrain circadian rhythms. And then of course, we like our GIFX uh, stool testing so we can find out if we've got inflammation from infections. Um, we'll use uh, nasal cultures for the nose, cone beam CTs if patients have old root canals, 
And that's how we find our inflammation. If if you'll do those things up front, granted, my bent was to start as a chiropractor. I didn't have prescribing rights, so I couldn't just prescribe the hormones by looking at the biomarkers. We were forced to learn this. But I have to say, patients not only get better biomarkers and fewer symptoms, but you're actually moving the needle on their health and longevity. And as we all know, the term now is health span. This is how we achieve better health span and we take fewer hormones. It's like just throwing a little icing on the cake when it's all done. So I really hope that this has equipped you for where to start and that if you will just take a little time to understand some of the nuances of um, the upstream regulation, that is our brain, our nervous system, then everything downstream becomes so much more easy to manage. Again, I'm really grateful for your time and thanks for listening. Thank you for joining us today. You'll receive a recording of today's talk in your email inbox shortly. As a reminder, you're already signed up for Module 4 on April 10th, which is a panel discussion featuring all of our previous speakers, Integrated Approaches in Hormonal Health.